during the break, we were chatting about the debate we just had about the safety of the Epsom Derby, um, sort of the animal um, going to be protesters invading the, the race course. We're joined now to go through the papers, Andy Jones and Claire Purcell. Andy, um, you've worked in the race journalism game, and Claire, you're a horse owner yourself. So why don't we start with this story? Um, is it time to stop races like the Epsom, though? It's not the Grand National. It's not known. I think we just pointed out there, Nevin, that there have only been three deaths since 2003. The last death was 2006. Is it the wrong protest at the wrong time, Andy? It's always a very strange place to target the Epsom Derby. I mean, if, you, if you're ever going to if you're ever going to pass comment on cruelty of animals in the UK, the horse would be absolutely far and away the least at-risk animal. I mean, horse race, race horses live in centrally in stables. They have round-the-clock veterinary care. They have round-the-clock stable lad, last care. Uh, they often have swimming pool solariums, uh, anything from sort of psychologists and horse whisperers and stuff. And comparing them and throwing them in there lo in the same lot with the battery hen or the the, the dairy cow that doesn't see any dairy, uh, it doesn't see any daylight at all, seems very very strange to me. But Great Britain has the highest standard of horse care in the world, um, and these animals, the, the, the fatality rate, the mortality rate, and horses do sometimes die on race courses is is below 0.5 percent. Yeah. And when any animal dies, it's obviously a Tragedy, but horses are more far more likely to die running around in a field, etc. And horses that aren't within racing are, and Claire will talk about this, are not always the best cared for outside of race. You know, in a field being left out in all weathers, etc., etc. The, the racehorse has a, a fabulous life. There is very, very limited risk yeah. in the Epsom Derby. There's no obstacles, etc., etc. And even if you look at it from a dispassionate viewpoint, these horses are worth any horse running in the Epsom Derby is probably worth about half a million quid. The idea that you put them at unnecessary risk seems absolutely astonishing. But I do believe, though, um, that Louisa Animal Rising made some really good points. And that is that we all care about horse well-being, we all care about safety. And I think one of the positive things, actually, to come out of talking about this is making things like the Grand National safer. And we've seen over the years now that the, that the jumps have been made lower and, and the water um, not quite as wide. But... Are they going to just try and close down horse racing altogether? And surely that's a retrograde move. They'll just sell the horses to like, the Saudi Arabians. Well, this is it. What happens to those horses who are bred for a specific purpose? They are athletes. They are good at their job. They enjoy doing their job. So what would you do with them if you suddenly said no racing whatsoever? You're going to have horses that are going to go to people who are disreputable owners, disreputable breeders. Who have got no understanding of looking after a no thoroughbred racehorse. It's not like having a, an ordinary horse. It needs constant care they, they and do. attention. And they're going to get sold abroad. They're going to perhaps enter the food chain, which I know people get very upset about. I mean, the Jockey Club is quite interesting. have put £40 million pounds in to horse welfare. That is a substantial amount of money and I don't think it's given enough credit. The race courses are safer places, especially with the Grand National. We've seen an awful lot of improvements made to that. And, and your guest did have some really valid points, but I do think they misunderstand the nature of an animal. If you're going to hold a horse up, as we saw at the Grand National, for 15 to 20 minutes, they're ready to do their job. They're all hyped up. That is when more accidents are going to happen, when a horse gets stressed out. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to keep them there walking around in hot conditions as it was at the Grand National, they are stressed and they are going to then explode. And that's when you get more accidents coming in. I, it's always going to be that debate that you have around animal safety and animal cruelty. The vast, vast majority of horse owners absolutely love their animals and will give them more care than they would themselves. I have seen people with horses wrapping themselves up with a, an old piece of bandage just so they can get back to their horse and their horse will have veterinary treatment, it will have the best tack, the best feed, dietary supplements. They will look after that animal better than they do themselves and their family. Mm. And, well, quickly, final point. Uh, they were talking, somebody from Animal Rebellion was talking yesterday about banning dog ownership, cat ownership, etc., etc., and banning horse ownership altogether. And somebody made the point, well, what do you do with these horses? They won't exist. And he said, oh, well, well, fair enough. And the idea of not existing at all 
uh, or running the risk of a 0.00 whatever percent of having an accident on a race course and or wherever else seems absolutely agreeable to. But this also, point. when you when you look at things like mental health, so, so just discarding racehorses for a moment, animals themselves are so good for people's mental health. Mm. And I think if you start to get rid of pet ownership in any way, shape, or form, the mental health of people will just deteriorate even further. Mm. I just I don't understand this mentality of you can't have anything, therefore you must just put your yeah. lovely pampered cat out onto the street. And we're such an animal-loving nation, yeah. aren't we? I mean, people and their pets, British people and their pets, I mean, they are part of the family. Yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't seem quite fitting, does it, that an animal rising group would want to get rid of that, pets that are loved so very much. And that's when I think they lose the room. You mm. know, it's like, OK, let's make horse racing safer, but yeah. you're not allowed to own a dog. It's like, come on, mate. Yeah. It's just gonna. This is just a little bit yeah. silly now. The dog is yeah. the most pampered member of the family, especially yeah. in my house. That's all it goes. <laughs> um, Claire, let's move on to you, shall we? And this is a story in the Times. Um, teacher strikes are normalising kids skipping school. This is concerning, isn't yeah. it? It is really concerning. So the teacher strikes that we've all seen is normalising children missing school on a regular basis. This is the Children's Commissioner for England, Dame Rachel D'Souza, has said consistently getting children back to school and then taking days off has led to this whole attitude now from from children, from parents to say, well, it doesn't matter. If you miss a day off of school, it doesn't matter. And I think that kids have been so affected by lockdowns. They have missed so much school, mental health problems, learning deficits. To then have teachers' strikes being used as another excuse for a day off, you can see how this is going to affect children. School doesn't seem very important then. Yeah, and I wonder, Andy, um, we said all along that the, the children most affected by this were, were those at the bottom, you know, the, the impoverished working-class kids who weren't having attentive homeschooled, and all their parents didn't have a lockdown. They still had to go to work, care workers, you know, late, you know that sort of job. We're still seeing up to 100,000 kids missing from school altogether. Is this idea of strikes, you know, bunking off, just, just making kids think, well, what's the point of school? And it's a very dangerous, you're absolutely right, it's a very dangerous thing to, to bake into young minds as well, because eventually these individuals need to be working, constructive members of society, and then if you can't handle school day to day, it becomes quite difficult to then learn that skill later on in life. We talk again about mental health, mental health, mental health. One of the best cures, school can be a very distressing place for young people sometimes, but one of the best cures for mental health is to be around your peers, out in the fresh air, having the stimuli of different lessons etc and I think one of the big costs of Covid and it was barely talked about at the time of shutting everyone in of, of, of losing all of the skills that you learn at school and then also the socialisation that you get from school as well OK Andy you've got a, a sort of related story in the mail about lecturers going on, on strike essentially they're, they're on a marking boycott and it means that students aren't getting their grades back yeah, um, lecturers have had strikes, uh, and with lecturers have had strikes over various different points over the last few years. However, one of the big impacts is students who are paying more for education now than ever are being told, actually, you're not going to get your grades either later or at all in some cases. And these are quite big universities. This is Cambridge, this is Edinburgh, and I dare say lots of slightly less salubrious universities as well. And if you are a university leaver, you know that job market is fierce. You know no, if you don't have the grades and have the grades immediately, employers go and hire somebody else. And then they, you are then stuck waiting or doing a job that's less than what you might normally have got, or you're waiting for next year to then reapply. Yeah. And I think that's really, really unfair when students get into huge debt, yeah. they're paying more ever than educated for education, and they're basically being told, not only have you missed huge chunks because of COVID, only if you missed huge chunks having to sort of learn from home, which isn't the same, it's now actually yeah. the grade that you worked hard for, you're not going to And get. a lot of those students, of course, paying nine grand a year to sit in prison in a, in a, little, in a little kind of rabbit hutch. Um, student coordination, watching a lecturer online. They weren't even at work, these people. Now they're going on strike. Anyway, that's just me. Let's quickly have a little bit of fun news at the end, Claire. The Princess and Princess of Wales um, looking very sort of um, regal and precisely the opposite of um, Meghan and Harry. I mean, the photographs that have come out 
uh, the Princess of Wales just looks absolutely stunning. Mm. She came out at this wedding in this beautiful pink dress. I mean, I just think they are the picture of what the modern royal family is going to be. Their behaviour is always impeccable. They have gone to a wedding and they look like they had a really good time. And I, I just love the fact that we can see these snaps and the slight lip reading <laughs> of, uh, of William saying to Kate, you know, chop, chop, we need to move on when they were in the receiving line and having a chat with their friends. And it's that normal bit of life that comes into to their relationship, which I think is really refreshing. They're not out there for personal gain. They're out there to do a job. They are working royals. And I think that they absolutely do that with aplomb. They yeah. do. They truly do. And they do look like a king and queen in waiting, yes. don't they? They really do look the part. Claire, Andy, really good to see you. Thank you very much. We're back in the next hour. Thank you very much. You're watching GB News, Britain's news channel. More to come, including the latest on Philip Schofield as the former ITV star speaks to the media for the first time since the start of the scandal.